Okay, welcome to the review session. Uh, this week, we're going to review variation of parameters, which is another method of finding a particular solution to a non uh, homogeneous equation. And we'll focus on second order differential equations here. Uh, so this method of variation parameters is more general than um, method of undetermined coefficients. Okay, it's more general in the sense that to use method of undetermined coefficients, if you recall, uh, the coefficients for y and its derivatives have to be scalars, numbers. And number two, the right-hand side of this non-homogeneous equation has to be of a simple enough form uh, in the sense that it's like a polynomial or polynomial times the simple exponential possibly times uh, either a sine or a cosine. Okay. So in that sense, method of undetermined coefficients is limited even though these are uh, these functions model many things, so it's not unuseful. Okay. So for the method of undetermined coefficients, we can have the coefficients not being scalars necessarily. They could be functions of the independent variable. Say, let's call that variable x. And the right-hand side doesn't have to be of the form polynomial times simple exponential times sine or cosine. It could be something else, like tangent squared, for example. Okay. <clears throat> now, with variation parameters, we will have to first look at the homogeneous version of the differential equation. So we will have to first look at something in this form equal to zero. And we have to first find the solutions, the fundamental solution set. So we need to know two independent functions that satisfy the homogeneous equation. Okay. And let's just recall that the Vronskian of the fundamental solution set is uh, going to be non-zero on some interval if these functions are, uh, the functions in this fundamental solution set are independent. Is it non-zero on some interval? Okay. For which our uh, solution set uh, solves uh, the differential equation. Okay, so uh, so using variation of parameters does hinge on our knowing the fundament, a fundamental solution set for the homogeneous equation. So once you do have the fundamental solution set, what you do is you assume that the particular solution to the non-homogeneous equation is some combination of the fundamental solution set except now the, the coefficients for y1 and y2 are not no longer constants, but rather some unknown functions of x. C1 and C2 are unknown functions of x. Okay, 
so we make this uh, assumption that we can find a particular solution to the non-homogeneous equation and then figure out what those unknown functions, C1 and C2, would have to be to satisfy this non-homogeneous equation. So uh, just a quick uh, caution, when we're talking about the formulas we're about to develop, uh, the formulas are premised on you writing your second order differential equation in this conventional form. In other words, the coefficient for y double prime has to be one, okay? So you, uh, before doing anything when using variation parameters, using the formulas for variation parameters, make sure that the coefficient for y double prime is one. So for example, if, uh, We have this second order initial equation, say. Uh, then uh, we wouldn't, you want to use the formulas that we're going to develop for finding C1 and C2 for a particular solution without first dividing everything by x squared so as to get this equation into this uh, conventional form. So inevitably, there's going to be a student that's going to not do this <clears throat> before trying to use variation of parameters and not get the correct particular solution. So this is the conventional form that we need to start with. Okay, so that way you can correctly recognize the function multiplying y prime and the function multiplying y and the right hand side function let's call it g of x okay all right so once we make this assumption but what the particular solution would look like we then differentiate well uh, we plug in yeah, we plug in the, the, the y particular let's just call that y as a particular solution without the subscript P. So that we can save on notation. So it's going to be some function C1 times Y1 plus some function C2 times Y2. And of course, to figure out what C1 and C2 have to be, we would want to plug in Y and its derivatives. Okay. So we're going to differentiate once using the product rule on the first factor term, sorry. And then using the product rule again on the next term. The C and the the C's and the Y's are all functions of X, so we need to use product rule. Okay. Now we're gonna regroup. We're gonna collect the terms that have the derivatives of the C's together. And then the terms that uh, don't have the derivatives of the C's. And then we're going to make a assumption that will allow us to just work with the derivatives, of the first order derivatives of the C. Because of course, we're going to have to differentiate again, right? We're going to have to find Y double prime so that we can plug it in here. 
Okay, but I'm going to simplify the situation because I just want to be. I just want to work with first order derivatives of c1 and c2, not second order, right? So if we were to differentiate again and use product rule, you would get c1 double prime. So, and we, we don't want that actually. We, we want to keep it simple. So it turns out that we can make the assumption. Let's see one prime y1 plus c2 prime y2, whatever c1 and c2 are. Let's assume that we can find c1 and c2 so that this is zero. Therefore, this will just go, go away. So that's nice. That'll become zero. And then we can take the resulting y, the simplified y prime. It's just this part is left. And then differentiate again, uh, find y double prime and using product rule again. Right, so we differentiated the first term using product rule. Now we're going to differentiate the second term using product rule. So now we're ready to uh, let's let's see take y let's just y prime and y double prime and plug them into the non-homogeneous differential equation that has been written in standard in this conventional form. Let's get so. Let's see. Uh, y double prime. Well, then plus p times y prime. So we're going to take y prime over here and multiply it by p. Okay, plus q times y. So we're going to take y and multiply it by q. That looks like a mess, but believe me, this will simplify in a surprising and pleasant manner. And that's equal to the right-hand side over here, g of x. So I apologize if my, the q's and g's kind of look alike. should be more careful. Okay, so now we're going to regroup, regroup, I guess, uh, according to the um, derivatives of C. So we're going to have some terms which involve the derivatives of the C's. So first order derivatives. And so and then order uh, the remaining things that don't involve the derivative of the C's. C, let's take the C1 business. Okay, so those are three terms. That have uh, that uh, have the factor c1, and so that's a c1 becomes a common factor. So we'll just factor that out, and we'd be left with y1 double prime plus p times y1 prime, and then plus q y1, and then we group together all the terms that have a factor of C2 in them so that we can factor out C2 and we're left behind with this, which you might already 
you've seen or you can guess what's going to happen next. We know that Y1 and Y2 are uh, constitute the fundamental solution set. So they are solutions to the homogeneous version of the differential equation. So, and this is exactly us plugging in Y1 and Y2 into this equation, so we know that these must be zero. So nice simplification indeed. So we're left with this equation. So now this together with the assumption that we made, okay, and I'll just copy this. We assumed that this equation holds. It's a it's one of those like let's assume this is true and let's see if that word assumption is fruitful. And indeed it will be. Uh, well, okay. Maybe it was just easy. It would be easier to copy that. <laughs> I think I'll just do that instead of trying to drag it. Okay, so let's see what we have. Let me just clear this out and just write the two equations that we have. Okay, so we assume that c1 prime y1 plus c2 prime y2 was zero, and by plugging in uh, the form of our particular solution. Um, we entered the differential equation, we found we have another equation. And that's equal to the right-hand side of the non-homogeneous equation. So you probably recognize this uh, as a system of differential equations, which we can think in terms of linear algebra. write the system as a matrix equation, differential matrix equation, where the coefficients, quote unquote, multiplying the C1 and 2 prime are Y1, Y2. And for the second row, we get Y1 prime plus Y2 prime. And that's equal to the right-hand side column, which is 0 and G of x, again, to the function of x. OK, and so this is uh, looks nice, right? Because we recognize that, for example, the determinant of this matrix uh, is the Vronskian. You know, I'm going to assume that we know it's, everything's a function of x. So we know that, at least on some interval, this won't be 0. So we can, there's a unique solution to this equation then, right? Our matrix is invertible. And uh, I think the conventional thing to do here is just to use Kramer's rule. Is it Kramer or Kramer? I don't know. Okay, so if you recall, maybe this is a good time to recall Kramer's rule. Uh, if you have okay, so suppose we have 2x minus y equals 4, and here we have let's say x plus 5y equals 1, right? It's a system of two equations to unknowns, which we can write as a matrix equation. Okay. And then Kramer's rule says that, you know, for this square system, so we have as many equations as unknowns, and assuming that the determinant of this matrix is not zero, we can solve for x by 
computing the ratio of two determinants. Uh, in the denominator, we have the determinant of the original coefficient matrix. So you see why we would want that determinant to be non-zero. But on the uh, in the numerator, we compute the determinant of the matrix you get if you replace the first column with the right-hand side, but otherwise leave the matrix of coefficients unchanged. And we replace the first column because we're solving for the first unknown. Okay. And then the second unknown, y, again, is a ratio of two determinants. In the denominator, we have the determinant of the original matrix of coefficients. In the numerator, since we're sol solving for y, the second unknown, we would replace the second column with the right-hand side here, right? But otherwise, leave the matrix of coefficients alone. Okay, so now it's just a matter of computing the determinant. So 20 minus a negative 1. In the denominator, we get 20 minus negative 1. Oh my gosh, 10. Uh, 2 times 5 is 10, folks. Let that be a lesson. Okay. Oh, no, well, that's... Okay. No, that 4 times 5 is 20. I'm, my bad. So 10 minus a negative 1 in the denominator. So apparently x is going to be uh, 21 over 11. And y would be, say, 2 minus 4, and then 11. So negative 2 elevenths. That's how you can, if you recall Kramer's rule. All right. But that's what you want to use over here, correct? So to go back over here. Because we know, you know, by the nature of the fundamental solution set, the determinant is not going to be zero. We can use Kramer's rule to get a formula for, to solve for C1 prime, rather. Okay. We're going to get the determinant of the matrix of coefficients, so to speak, over there in the denominator. And in the numerator, we're going to replace the first column because we're solving for C1 prime with the right hand side, and but leave uh, the otherwise leave the matrix unchanged here. Okay. So we get uh, using computing the determinant. And then this determinant, of course, is exactly what we mean by the Vronskian. So we'll just write that as a Vronskian of y1 and y2. Similarly, C2 prime we're going to have the Vronskian in the denominator. And since we're, sol we're solving for C2, we'll replace the second column with the right-hand side. Computing these determinants in the numerator, we get G times Y1. In the denominator, again, we just get the Vronskian for the fundamental solution set. Okay. And of course, now to solve for C1, in C2, we just anti-differentiate to undo the derivative. So C1 will be the integral or the anti-derivative of this, ex uh, this ex expression or this function. And C2 is the anti-derivative of this. Okay. So, in a sense, after all the uh, fuss, you kind of just need to know these formulas, right? Even though it's nice to know how they're derived, especially if you are going to be solving using variation parameters for higher order differential equations. OK. 
Okay. So now to uh, summarize, and then we'll do examples, of course. Uh, we have a non-homogeneous uh, second order differential equation written in the conventional form where y double prime gets uh, has a coefficient of one. Okay, we found the fundamental solution set. So uh, y1 and y2 are solutions to the homogeneous uh, version of this differential equation. Number two, we assumed that a particular solution is going to be a combination of the fundamental solution set where the uh, coefficients for y1 and y2 are unknown functions of x. And then we use the formula uh, the, the formulas here to find what C1 and C2 are. And then finally, our general solution is always is going to be a combination of the fundamental solution set with unknown coefficients A and B, scalars, plus the particular solution. Yes, yeah, so homogeneous plus particular gives you all possible uh, solutions. Uh, solutions of homogeneous plus the, the particular solution to the non-homogeneous equation gives you all possible solutions. Okay. So let's do examples. Okay. Oh, at, and at this point, I guess if you had, uh, if you if you have initial conditions. It's at this point that you solve for A and B, not before, of course. So you have Y at some initial time, or I guess I'm using X for my independent variable. So for our second order differential equations, we're gonna need two initial conditions or possibly maybe boundary con conditions. Then, then you uh, use them. Okay. So that took about half an hour, right, uh, of just outlining the procedure. So I think it would be wise to do some examples. All right. So let's start with the. Uh, like a simple example for which we could have used um, method of undetermined coefficients. Okay. One. So example number one. So we could have used undetermined coefficients because we have constant uh, coefficients multiplying y and its derivatives. And the right-hand side is of a simple enough form, namely polynomial degree one. <clears throat> but just for practice, we're going to use method of, uh, oh, sorry, variation of parameters. So number one, we need a fundamental solution set to the homogeneous equation, version of this equation. So you replace the right-hand side with zero. We can write down our characteristic polynomial. Uh, you, know, you can use quadratic formula. Of course, this factors nicely. So the two roots are one and two. So we know that the fundamental solution set is e to the r1 t. So remember, we're, we're assuming solutions of this form. 
So e to the first root times x, y2 would be e to the second root and then times x. Okay, so that's our fundamental solution set. So next we assume that our particular solution is going to be some combination of these. And so then we could rederive the whole, all the formulas, go through the procedure. But I think we should just want, we want to take advantage of the formulas for C1 and C2. So C1 is the antiderivative of uh, negative G times Y2 divided by the Vronskian, the fundamental solution set. And there's the formula for C2. All right, so let's uh, might as well first compute the Vronsky. Okay, so it's the determinant of, um, so you have y1, y2, and then the derivatives of those in the next row. And the determinant would be e to the 3x. And indeed, that's positive, right? Everywhere, so. OK. <clears throat> All right, so now it's just a matter of integration, I think. It's kind of a routine. Thing. It's formulaic, I guess. So minus g. What was g, by the way? Uh, the right-hand side is just x. So g is just x. y2 was e to the 2x. And the Vronskian is e to the minus, oh, sorry, e to the 3x. So we can simplify, and it looks like this is a uh, routine application of integration by parts. I'll just use the tabular method. Okay, so the result should be uh, this product and then minus per formula this product. So we get x time. And I'm going to ignore the constant of integration. If we included it, then, well, since uh, the constant of integration, if we had one, um, let's call it k, since it's the C1, it's going to be multiplying e to the x. You would just get uh, uh, something that looks uh, e looks like the part of the fund uh, homogeneous solution, uh, homogeneous solution. Okay, but I'm just going to ignore that. Okay, so now C two. Is uh, the antiderivative of g the right hand side? y1, which is e to the x, divided by the Vronskian, which we computed to be e to the 3x. OK, so that looks like it's another uh, uh, routine application of integration by parts. So the product 
minus and then the next product. So that looks like okay. All right, so there we go. We have C1 and C2. So now we know that our particular solution this assumed form and now we know C1 uh, and Y1 was e to the X. We know C2 and Y2 was e to the 2X. So it looks like we just get a polynomial because of course these uh, become one. Okay, so our particular solution is a first degree polynomial. <clears throat> Indeed, we could have probably eyeballed that if, if you looked at the <laughs> if you look at the fairly simple right hand side, uh, and even we, I think we I'm pretty sure we would get the same result using method of undetermined coefficients, even though it's not always the case that variation parameters yields the same particular solution that undetermined coefficients would. All right, you can see why this would work. Okay, so now our most general solution to the non-homogeneous equation is a combination of uh, is a uh, the, the general solution to the homogeneous version. So it's a combination of the fundamental solution set functions plus this particular solution. So this next example, notice that we wouldn't be able to use method of undetermined coefficients to find a particular solution because the uh, we don't have constant coefficients for the uh, for y and its derivatives okay all right we do need to invest time into finding a fundamental solution set to the homogeneous version of this equation so we're going to find a fundamental solution set. But since we probably haven't, don't know how to do this yet, right? We can't. We don't have a character polynomial that we know of when we don't when we have non-constant coefficients. Instead, I'm just going to look at this homogeneous equation and say, hey, look, uh, one solution, one uh, quote unquote obvious solution is that, you know, our function is x. That would satisfy the equation. Indeed, you can verify easily that this is uh, a solution to the homogeneous equation. So then recall that we do have a method called reduction of order. which would allow us to find a second linearly independent solution to the homogeneous equation. Okay, so recall that we assume that the second solution is some uh, unknown function of x, let's call it u, times y1, first solution. And we derived a formula for this unknown function. So this was reduction of order from earlier in the semester. Oh, and of course, caution. This formula does assume that you have your differential equation written in this conventional form. Where the coefficient for y double prime is 1. 
Okay, and we don't have that yet, right? So I need to divide everything by x squared. Uh, I'm assuming that x is not zero, and even simpler, I'll just assume it's positive. So the re rewriting our equation in conventional form, we recognize p as negative one over x. Okay. So then we use our reduction of order formula. So then we can say minus p, but p is already minus one over x, so that's one over x. And then y1 is x, so the denominator, denominator becomes x squared, and we get 1 over x. If we simplify, which gives us natural log of x, and I assumed x is positive. So we know that a second solution here, y2, is u, which we found to be natural log of x times y1, which is x. Okay, so we have indeed completed the first step of uh, finding a most general solution to this non-homogeneous equation, we have the fundamental solution set. And we, this allowed us to also kind of review reduction of order for the next exam, right? So now we find a particular solution to our non-homogeneous equation. And I'm going to, of course, use the one that's written in conventional form. And the right-hand side, let's see. Well, the right-hand side is 10x to the power 4. But remember that we divided everything by x squared. So this actually becomes 10 times x to the power 2. Okay, so the right-hand side is so. And now we can use, uh, so we, we identify the right-hand side after writing in conventional form. Just like that. So that's important to not, <clears throat> because the formulas we derive for C1 and and assuming our particular solution had looked like this, where C1 and C2 are unknown functions of x, we derived the formulas for C1 and C2. OK. So now it's just a matter of integration, right? So, um, and also, well, let's, let's complete the Vronskian first. How about that? So we have y1 and y2 from the fundamental solution set and its derivatives. So that's x log x plus x minus x log x. So that's going to be uh, just x. And we assume that x is positive. So the Vronskian is non zero on the interval from zero to infinity. Okay, so C1 is the negative of g and times y2 divided by the Vronskian. And so this is a uh, integration by parts problem again.
So using integration by parts, we get um, up to a constant of integration. And C2. So that's going to be, let's see, G times Y1, which is just X, divided by the Vronskin. So that's still just X. Okay, so now that we have C1 and C2, we can write down our particular solution. So C1 times X1 plus C2 times <clears throat> y2. Okay, so of course if we look at this uh, and simplify, we're going to have cancellations and we'd be left with 10 nines x to the power 4. So now we can write down a general solution here. A combination of the fundamental solution set. So a combination of Y1 and Y2 plus this particular solution. And this will work on the interval and the interval where x is greater than zero. So to summarize, uh, we looked at variation of parameters to finding a particular solution to a second order equation. Uh, so that was another method on top of method of undetermined coefficients. Where this method of variation of parameters was more general because unlike with the method of undetermined coefficients, we don't have to have constant coefficients for the y and y prime and y double prime. And the right hand side didn't have to be of the of the variety of you know polynomial times simple exponential times sine or cosine. And we developed uh, we knew that okay if we so we had to remember to write our equation in conventional form. And then we had a fundamental solution set. So sometimes you need to invest time in defining that. But then once we have a fundamental solution set, we found that assuming that a particular solution can be found in this form, we indeed found a confirming formula This method can be extended to higher order differential equations as well. 